Welcome back, everyone, to the Risk Intel Podcast, powered by SRA Watchtower, where we share risk intelligence with experts from across the banking industry. I'm your host, Ed Vincent, CEO at SRA Watchtower. Hello, welcome to the Risk Intel Podcast. Today with me is Nikki White, the Chief Growth Officer at SRA Watchtower and former Risk Officer, Audit Officer, and uh, Financial Institution Practitioner. Nikki, thank you very much for much for coming back and joining us today. Absolutely. Nikki, one of the, the, the hot topics that you've been encountering in conversations out in, in the market recently is around this distinction between enterprise risk management um, and the audit function. And so I'd like to drill into that a bit today. Let's, let's start... Um, by kind of going back to basics, if you will, and just talk about maybe in the context of the three lines of defense, right? The kind of the roles of, of risk management ver- versus audit, and then we'll get into you know alignment and and and, and interaction and, and and platforms and so on and so forth. But let's start by with kind of the the basics of risk versus audit. Absolutely. So it depends on the size of the institution, largely. Um, and there's some other factors as well. Do you have in-house internal audit? Do you have external internal audit, which always sounds kind of funny to say, but you know, for, for many institutions, it can be more efficient and more effective to leverage some outside resources to help you facilitate that function. And when we think about that, you've got your first line of the fence. Those are, those are the doers, the executors of the, of the controls. If the risk culture is not as mature as it, as it could be or should be, you may have individuals who are performing a, a control out of repetition and not necessarily understanding all implications that um, should that control fail, what could really happen? So making sure that that first line of defense is really an integral part and really well educated and informed about why the controls are what they are and, and what they do and how they impact overall operations, which then takes you kind of to the second line of defense. And that's that manager type level. That's that oversight and making sure that those controls are executed effectively uh, and making sure that that it's it's a holistic approach, right? Because you may also have individuals that are performing a control that affects multiple areas. And if they're only, if they've got their blinders on and they're only looking straight ahead, they may not necessarily see the purview. And that second line of defense can help to identify some and, and head off some potential issues that, that could come from uh, from some siloed operations. And then you've got that third line of defense that's really looking at the entire universe of controls. What are all the controls across the whole entire institution? You know, are they designed effectively? Because quite often the first and second line might need some help making sure that those controls are designed effectively um, and that they're executed effectively. So that's why you need that level of testing. I'm interested now in that, in that you know, when you think about those checks and balances, if you will, right, and, and the risk and the audit functions, right? how do they differ? And then, and how do you make sure that, that you respect those differences, but you also then have alignment between those two functions. That's a good question. A lot of people have some have struggled with some challenges there. You know, when you've got that that first line of defense, there's there's some element of self checking. You know, you want to go behind yourself. You may want to have some peer checking to make sure that by the time it rolls up, it's going okay. So that that quality control element, whether it's a preventative control or a detective control, can come into play to to make sure that your control is sound and, and this happening. But you know, when you think about that second level, it's it's really important to make sure that that they are working in tandem because you sometimes audit and we we've, we've talked about our in our other podcast episodes, audit and risk are the land of no. But really, you know, that that level of independence is important to make sure that the tests are executed properly and that you know there's there's the right amount of scrutiny being placed across all areas. But really, too, there, the function, the third line of defense function is to make sure that the organization is protected. And sometimes that does require some additional support and education and conversation and really being a part of the strategic vision and the mission of the entire institution. Okay, so are, are risk and audit the same thing then? Why, why, why the distinction, right? Why, why are there two functions there, if you will, rather than one? Sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. 
And sometimes people wear, wear both of those hats. And you know, that's where the independence piece can, can come into challenge because the risk function sometimes can operate a little bit more heavily on the management side from what we see in conversations. You know, that maybe there is an independent reporting line, but that dotted line is a pretty heavy, more solid line to, you know, directly to the CEO or, or to some senior leader. Um, but audit is really that outside checker that that should be that more um, robust, more more independent, really that outside thinking. Risk tends to be the one that that what we hear and what we see has a little bit more of a blurry line at times. OK, so you, you've you then will encounter in your conversations institutions where. You've got two people wearing the two different hats, or maybe some instances where you've got one person wearing the two different hats. But let, let's let's think about the scenario where you've got the, you know two people, two hats. Um, how do you ensure that those two functions are are aligned and and are efficient? And should they be using the same tools? Should they be um, right, right, what what are some what are some best practices? That's where we really see that ERM function becoming critical. And you know, typically that is owned by, by the risk office. When the risk office has a robust, well-rounded, non-siloed ERM function or, or ERM reporting cycle and, and reporting methodology, it encompasses audit. It encompasses all of the various lines of defense. It encompasses all of the risk activities that are happening throughout the entire institution. Whereas audit is focused on the controls, the testing, the effectiveness, the, the outcomes, and you know, the both positive and negative. ERM is looking at the so what. And what we often find is that it's important because the audit team is testing the controls that quite often live within the risk function. But the auditors can, can oftentimes have different needs for the tools that help them to support that. They need um, computer automated testing to make sure that they're evaluating sufficient quantities and diversity of transactions. Um, the risk function needs more clear abilities to communicate risk information to non-risk individuals. And so it's it's for a different audience, it's for a different purpose, but it's really important to make sure that those things are aligned. And what we see also sometimes is that from an ERM perspective and from an audit perspective, sometimes those two plans can become out of alignment. When we think about the liquidity focus in the industry in the past you know, year and a half or so, how many audit plans have changed as a result of that? How many risk reporting functions have changed as a result of that? Or did they just stay status quo? Sometimes the, the audit risk assessment is performed every year, every 18 months, every, every two years, or when something in the industry would necessitate it happens more frequently. Well, something certainly happened that would, would indicate that it should be updated, but has it always been? And when we look at the ERM reporting, maybe the audit uh, the audit function caught that sensitivity and, and modified their procedures to do some additional testing. But what about ERM? Does liquidity have as important and as elevated of an impact on the overall aggregated risk scores when it when it roll, when it boils up? I like to say that not all not all risks are created equal, and I think we certainly saw that in the past year. Love that. Uh, I love that that um, that contrast, if you will, uh, of uh, of the fact that audit is focusing on the the tests and the controls and to make sure that the program is being uh, enacted effectively, and then risk is the so what um, and right. So what right? How do you interpret you know those you know those uh, you know the results of that of that audit work? I think it's also interesting to think about the fact that audit is one of potentially many inputs into that ERM view of the world, right? And so whether that, you know, that to, to get that holistic picture of enterprise risk management, you're gonna have some results uh, and findings around your, your risk and controls and, and your self-assessment program and your audit program. You're gonna have some information from your, you know, your, your ALCO area. You're gonna have uh, interest rate and credit information. You're gonna have some operational inputs. Um, ERM is really looking at it holistically, and audit is one of the inputs into that holistic picture. How about maybe a, a closing question here around um, 
around platforms because you do see you, you know, I know you've encountered situations recently where folks are trying to use an an audit platform to perhaps do that, do that ER, you know, do that ERM work. Um, how do you how do you react and what have you what do you see in that space? As is often the case, software is developed with a key element and intended purpose, and then it grows and expands and adds on. And we we love innovation, right? We we're in an innovative industry. The world is not the same as it was yesterday or ten years ago or twenty years ago. So I think it's important for software companies to continue to innovate, but also that doesn't necessarily mean that you can be everything to everybody. And, and what we really see is that the auditor's needs are very different than, than what the risk manager's needs are in many aspects. And so, whereas the audit function may have needs for work paper management or attestation sign-offs and retention in accordance with the, the varying bodies of, of regulation, not necessarily banking, but you know from the, from the auditing and uh, accounting side of standards, there are requirements that they must meet in order to have those sign-offs. Those don't necessarily live within an ERM function. Similarly, being able to track metrics and establish risk appetites and being able to pull in all of that information for areas outside of, um, outside of audit tasks is sometimes more of an afterthought and, and can sometimes lead to a less than ideal or less than robust reporting structure. I, I, I like the specifics there, right? Of, you know, risk papers versus tracking risk appetite. Those are two different things. Um, and and I think that the, the concept that, you know, something is developed with an, uh, an objective in mind you know, that that's typically what that system is going to be great at. And when it branches off into other pieces, that's potentially when it gets gets a bit a bit diluted. And so I think looking for an ERM platform that allows you to pull in and integrate with and 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 ingest data from an audit system and a GRC and an a, you know set of alco data and financial data and operational data. Um, that's the that's the best practice is is being able to then consolidate that standardize um, right on on a, on a common rating scale and then as as we've talked about in some some other episodes report that back through really robust reporting and, and dashboarding and, and as you, as you said right allowing you know that risk function to communicate to non-risk individuals so I thought that was a really great way to articulate it Nikki thank you very much appreciate your thoughts on uh, on this topic and I think if we can if I can encapsulate it in 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 kind of a one key key line here it's the it's the fact that our, that audit is focusing on those tests and controls, and then the risk reporting encompasses the the so what you know what what does this mean in that interpretation? I think that's a great way to articulate. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Of course.